Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to The House. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us from all around the world. And we hope more than anything that you might find hope and life in learning about the person of Jesus. If you're looking for additional information about The House or just for more resources, you can find them online at thehouseonline.ca. Thanks for joining us today, and enjoy the service. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome to the house, everybody. Oh, there it is. Welcome to the house. Um, I'm glad we have such a big crowd in here this evening. It's lovely to have you all here. Um, don't be shy, you're allowed to sit closer to the front. You're definitely allowed to do that. Okay, well, we're gonna start playing and then everyone else will catch on and they'll come join us, so let's go.
Welcome to church. Uh, we're just so glad that you're here with us tonight. You know, if it's your first time, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, please get your free coffee at the coffee shop at the end of the service. Um, that's on us tonight. You know, I truly believe that every time we come through these doors that it's not coincidence. I believe that, that God has a plan um, for every one of us, a plan for our lives. And part of that plan is that we're here tonight and that he wants to move in our lives right in this place tonight in this service. Uh, one of my favorite passages is um, when Jesus was talking about the farmer um, sowing the seed, and there was four types of soil, and um, there was three types of soil that didn't bear any fruit. The soil was too hard, or it was too, um, the soil wasn't deep enough um, for, the, for the seed to take root. There's one type of soil, one type of soil that had, that was fertile, and the soil was soft, and the seed was able to go down and, and create deep roots in the soil and produce a huge harvest. And Jesus said that that soil, is, that soil is our heart. The seed was the same seed that was sown in all the soils, but in the bad soil, it produced no harvest. So it's up to us, it's our responsibility to take care of our heart, to make sure that, that our hearts are receptive to the Word of God in our lives. Proverbs says, um, guard your heart above all else, for out of it flow everything of life. Out of your heart flows every issue of life. So it's our responsibility to take care of our heart so we can be receptive to the Holy Spirit and, and allow Him to move in our lives. So um, I have great expectation for tonight for what God wants to do here, um, even as we surrender to Him tonight. So um, let's just pray a simple prayer uh, with me, if that's your cry tonight. Just um, whoever you want to surrender. Um, yeah, Jesus, we just surrender this night to you, God. We say... Once again, God, uh, we just humble ourselves and say, uh, forgive us for any pride, for any hardness of heart, Lord. We just surrender to you right now in this moment. And we just say, come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. Um, just move in our hearts, move in our lives by your spirit tonight and just shape us and mold us that that seed would go down deep into our hearts and produce, um, produce good fruit for your kingdom, Jesus. We just surrender tonight to you. We're expectant for what you're going to do um, in this place um, as we gather together and worship you. So, yeah, we just love you. We trust you. You're a good father. You want what's best for us. And we just surrender to your work in our lives tonight in this place. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.
constant and your word never wavers and when you speak um, we can have confidence in what you say help uh, help us tune our ears to you father to hear those words that you want to speak to us today and be obedient to how you're leading us in jesus name amen 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 well, why don't you go ahead and grab a seat and as you do as we'd like to let's let's thank and appreciate not just the worship team but all the volunteers and people that make uh, make the house what it is, really make this community uh, the life of what it is. We just want to say welcome, so glad you're here. My name is Ryan, I serve on the leadership team here. Uh, it's so, so so great to have you. Um, if this is your first time here, we hope more than anything that you feel at home. Man, these lights feel bright tonight, holy moly. Wow, uh, <laughs> sorry, just, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, we're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time here, we want you to feel like you can be human, make mistakes, not have it all together. And we're all just trying to figure out who Jesus is and how his, his life here on earth, his coming, actually makes a difference to the way that you and I live our lives. And that's what we're really passionate about, excited that you've chosen to be a part of that adventure. And I just want you to feel comfortable and at home. Something else that, though, is really important to us is that uh, when you come feeling okay to stay, to be as you are, and that, that you actually feel motivated and encouraged to change, to grow. And our hope is, is that in our community, you might feel nudged to take the next step, both the next step in our community, uh, being a part of the life and, and the all the things that happen here for your social and, and community growth and, and your spiritual growth, that we want you to grow spiritually, take the next step in your relationship with God uh, and, and grow that way. And so there's a few simple ways that we say that you can do that. Uh, the first is to discover an affinity group. Uh, be a part of one of our affinity groups, which are things that meet uh, on a, on a kind of monthly basis. Um, they're vocational-based, interest-based. So if you're into art and those types of things, we have one for that. Uh, if you're into business, we have a business affinity group and so we'd love for you to plug into a group that way these aren't you're not gonna like have a crazy holy spirit well i mean maybe you will have a crazy holy spirit encounter i don't know um but but really these are designed for you to network and meet other people with similar challenges and interests as you uh, the next is to participate in a growth track. And this is something like our David series, which we have going on. Uh, this Tuesday night is actually our last one. Um, as well, though, we have these open house groups. So things that you can actually pursue your spiritual growth in. Love for you to be a part of those. Uh, get involved and, and really find community and growing and knowing Jesus more together. And the last is in our serve teams. And we always say these are the things that make the house what it is. Uh, the people that make Sunday nights happen. And, and really all the personality that, that makes the house feel the way it does. And so if you um, are interested in being involved in the coffee shop or greeting or running a camera or doing something in tech or the worship team or anything in between, you could even drive the shuttle bus if you're trustworthy. Um, we would love for you to be involved and be a part of the team. Uh, it's so, so great. Uh, admittedly, usually I have a nice eight and a half by 11 paper that tells me the announcements that I'm supposed to say next. But because I was playing on stage tonight, I actually realized that I'm as terrible at multitasking as my wife says I am. And so I don't have one. Um, but I think we have an all ages women's movie night coming up. Um, like all ages, and we're doing that here at the house. That is on this Friday, December 8th. Come, get comfy, cozy. Love for you to be a part of that. Again, this is a multi-generational Oh, soup. This is, oh, that's good. Yeah, Catherine's reminding me. This is so bad, guys. You don't even know. Um, this week is our last week of student lounge, okay? And so love for you to uh, come out Monday, Tuesday, 3 till, se three till 9 and 3 till 7. Um, but don't come the following week, okay? This, this Monday, Tuesday, last one. Love for you to study for your exams. Okay, what's our next one? Come on, help me out. All right. No, we're not, we're going to skip that one. This is comical. Hey, this is mine. I like this. Young couples. Uh, if you are a young couple in an engaged or married relationship, we'd love for you to come hang out with us. Uh, Sarah and I are hosting on Friday, December 15th. We're just going to be hanging out at our place, doing dessert, uh, some food and some drinks, and it'd be a great time for you to network and meet some people who are in a similar stage of life as you. 
Okay, and if you want to be a part of the house this evening and, and worship financially, uh, you can do that through text, through the donation station, online. I really want to encourage you, if you call the house home and you, you'd say, hey, this is where I belong, uh, to consider worshiping with us in this way. We really believe that there's so much joy in giving back to God what, what he's given to us and that we actually are most fulfilled uh, when we're engaged in worshiping him in that way. And so i um, love for you to be a part of that. I'm going to invite James up this evening. Uh, James is our guest speaker. James is also uh, the director over on campus for UCM. Uh, and it's really great because we, as a university outreach ministry, get to... Oh, that doesn't... That was exciting. Get to partner with James, his people, his crew, and, um, and do ministry together. And so... Having James be a part of the house on a Sunday night is just one way that we can say, hey, we're on the same team here. We're doing the same thing for the same reason. We really want you guys uh, to find a deeper and greater relationship, life, and hope in the person of Jesus. And so James is going to kind of cap off tonight our series. We've been working on David and, and through the life of David and really exploring that David is this ordinary shepherd boy uh, who God uses to do extraordinary things. And so I, I think, right, not bad. I think um, it is so cool that, that you and I, don't, we don't have to be superstars. God's not actually expecting perfection out of you, but because of Jesus, um, he gets to use us because he sees Jesus in us. And so James is going to talk about shepherding, what it looks like for you and I uh, to shepherd, to be shepherded and shepherd the people in our lives. And I'm really, really excited about it. So I'm going to pray for James and then turn it over. Lord, so thankful uh, that you don't expect us to be perfect, that our announcements don't need to be polished. Um, and Lord, that you have promised um, to show up here this evening, God, that, that you are so gracious to be revealing continuously more and more of yourself, that we might know a greater understanding of your love for us, and, and that in turn we might have deeper affections for you. And so, Lord, we love you. We're here to praise you, to learn from you and about you. I pray this in your name, and everyone said, amen. Thanks, Ryan. I love that connection. That was great. Um, as Ryan said, uh, I am James. I work as a campus missionary up at UBCO. Um, we are really thankful for uh, the partnership of the house at, uh, in September. Um, we were uh, able to launch our year with an outdoor worship and barbecue event. And uh, Dustin and his band came. And there's a, oh, good, there's a photo there. Dustin and his band came and Ryan helped us with the sound. And we had, for the first time ever, an outdoor worship experience at UBCO, praising God's name, declaring Jesus Lord uh, in the open airs. And that was a really fun experience. And so I hope we can do stuff, more stuff like that in the future. Um, we actually are looking forward to next semester. We're going to try to start doing a grocery run program. And the house is going to be offering its, its van to do that. So when Ryan talked about are there any uh, uh, drivers out there, that is a serious plug if you want to help in that ministry. Um, so tonight I do want to talk to you about the, the topic of discipleship. And I've titled this message, A Sheep from the Front, A Shepherd from the Back. And I want us to consider two essential life questions. Uh, who are you following and who is following you? Who are you following and who is following you? I recently uh, started playing basketball again in my life. I really wanted to get some exercise, and so I decided to start an old man basketball league, a little old man drop-in ball. Me and a few of my kind of 30-something uh, friends started this. And uh, we do this at Evangel on Wednesday nights. Of course, we call it vintage basketball. Uh, rather than old man, but uh, I grew up in the 90s when uh, kind of the rise of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, and, and I just became obsessed with Michael Jordan. He was the best basketball player, and I just watched all of his games. I studied all his moves. Every Saturday, I would head to the local high school, and I would just shoot hoops all day, not not quite imagining I was Michael Jordan. I was too old for that. I wasn't imagining I was Michael Jordan. But I think I was definitely trying to imitate him. I was trying to pretend, I was trying to imitate all his moves. Um, Michael Jordan has this ritual when he shoots free throws. Uh, he takes the ball and he spins it once in his hands. He dribbles three times, he spins it again, and then he shoots. He does it the same way every single time. If you ever watch him, a lot of players have these kind of rituals to kind of get them calm before they shoot the free throw. To this day, I still shoot my free throws the same way. 
I spin the ball, I dribble it three times, I shoot. Um, I tried to imitate Michael Jordan because I wanted to get better at basketball. When it comes to this topic of discipleship, I've found that most Christians are, are unsure if they've been discipled. And even if they are sure that they've, they've had some type of formation, they've done some type of discipleship, um, many are unsure of what it means to go and make a disciple. But I believe that everyone can be a disciple because all of us already are. Every one of us follows someone the question really we have to ask ourselves is who? Who is it that we're following? Like everyone in this room right now, you all are a disciple of someone. Everyone in this city is a disciple of someone. Everyone in this whole planet is a disciple of someone. So it's not actually a question of do you follow someone, but it's actually a question of whose disciple will you be? And I think that's why the Bible makes um, uh, why we often, it makes use of this image of the sheep and the shepherd. Because we are all sheep. And we all need guidance. And we all, like sheep, need someone to follow. Like even leaders, when you look at those in the top echelons in, in our society, like CEOs and presidents and prime ministers and principals and professors and job site managers and hockey coaches, every one of them is a follower. And the best leaders among us actually tell us who they're following. Do you guys know who you are following? The question is never, will I be a follower? The question is always, who am I following? In John's gospel, in uh, chapter 10, uh, Jesus describes himself with one of these most memorable I am statements. He says, I am the good shepherd. We have the passage up here in verse one to six. He says to the Pharisees, very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a, sheep, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he is brought out, all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So the question dominating uh, chapter 9, the chapter right before our passage here, is, is Jesus from God or not? So Jesus had healed a man um, for, who, was being, who was born blind, and he healed him on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees refused to acknowledge that God had worked through Jesus. And in response, Jesus tells this parable about the sheep and the shepherds. And his point is clear. Like, look around. Look who's following me. The sheep are following the shepherd. So clearly Jesus is a man from God. Now, I had to... I, I had to explain a bit of, uh, you know, I'm going to explain a bit about this. What does it mean to be a sheep? What does it mean to be a shepherd? They understood immediately, and they understood this parable because they understood the relationship between a sheep and a shepherd. See, sheep literally know the audible sound coming from the mouth of the shepherd. In fact, they know it so well that they won't follow some other caller. As Jesus says, they will never follow a stranger. And in Palestine at that time, sheep were raised primarily for wool. And so they stayed with the shepherd for a long time. And so much so that the shepherd really got to know each sheep, you know, quite personally. Um, the average flock size was about 100. So these sheep, you know, they, he, they even started naming them. So imagine like a shepherd is like looking at a sheep and he's thinking, well, you're snowy and I'll call you boots and you're little runt. And right, he would, they would name these sheep. They'd know them so personally. And whenever called by name, the sheep would respond by following the shepherd wherever the shepherd went. As Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I call my own by name. Do we know his voice that well? Do we know the one who we're following? 
Jesus knows us that well. He knows us that personally. He, he knows our personalities. He can call us each by name. Another thing about sheep and shepherds, shepherds, they might share the same fold overnight. One or two or three shepherds might share their fold. They take shifts, kind of, it's about a protection thing. But the interesting thing is in the morning when a shepherd will go off to the side and he can call his own flock and those sheep will know his voice and separate from the other sheep. Jesus says, the sheep listen to my voice and they follow me. Now this parable, this, this parable didn't need to be explained to the first disciples. They instantly knew what Jesus meant by sheep and shepherds. He didn't have to take them aside and do some teaching like I just did there. He, they knew exactly what he meant when he said this. Uh, I, I, feel, I feel the same way about discipleship. Um, the first disciples, they, they didn't need to be explained what discipleship is. Um, in the first century, the Jewish, in the Jewish society, the most important person in the community was a rabbi. The rabbi was the interpreter of the Bible. The rabbi was the leader of the synagogue. The rabbi was basically kind of the educational system at the time. When children were about five years old, they would go to the synagogue and um, they would attend what was called Bet Sefer, the house of the book. And the rabbi would teach them to read and write, but also to memorize the Torah. They would actually memorize the first five books of the Bible. That was their education system. And then around the age of 10, most children would return home and they'd, they'd start helping with the, you know, they'd start learning the family trade or, or begin preparing for marriage. But the rabbi would choose some. He would, he would select the most promising students and they would stay on and they would continue in what was called Bet Midrash, the house of interpretation. And they would read and discuss the rest of the Old Testament and they begin learning the oral tradition of the rabbinical interpretation. Now, by the age of 15, most of these students would, you know, move on. They'd return home. Most of them would, you know, continue on with the family business. Some of them begin their families. But it's at this point that the rabbi would identify kind of the best of the best. The students, he, they, he believed, would have the potential to do what he does, know what he knows, and one day become the kind of person that he was. These students, or apprentices, were called Talmudin. They would go everywhere the rabbi went. They would eat whatever the rabbi ate. They would sleep wherever the rabbi slept. They would hang on his every word. One of the rabbinical blessings that would be spoken over a new disciple is this one. They would say, follow your rabbi, drink his words, and be covered by the dust of his feet. The imagery that you'd be hanging out with this person so much and so closely that you're actually covered in the same dust that they track up. The point of discipleship in the first century Jewish society was to live in such close relationship with the rabbi, to follow his example so well that they would not only live up to be like the rabbi, but that then one day they would go on to teach others the same. Um, I don't know about you, but have you ever read the beginnings of the Gospels, especially uh, the book of Mark, and wondered, you know, why is it that when Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he calls out to these couple of young fishermen, that the text says that they immediately drop their nets and go and follow after him? You ever wondered about that? I always thought, like, you know, it's kind of strange. Like, it doesn't give us a lot of background. What do they know about Jesus? Like, what? He just calls them to follow him, and they, they head off after him? But the thing is, if you understand discipleship in the first century, you understand the power of what Jesus just did there. He's calling these kind of like B-team guys. He's calling these not-so-good-enough guys and saying, come, follow me. They had probably stopped at the first stage, at the end of Bet uh, Sefer. They probably were, had been fishing for a long time. And Jesus calls them. He says, come and be with me. In a way, today, it'd be, like, it'd be like if I told you a story of someone who dropped out of high school and someone who just couldn't do math and they didn't know how to write a paper, but somehow Harvard 
invited them to come and be a student. It was kind of that radical. An invitation to be discipled was an invitation into a deep personal relationship where you would learn not only information, but you'd seek to imitate the one discipling you until the point where you were mature enough to innovate, to be a teacher yourself. Now, in all our culture, this word imitation, it doesn't really always have great connotations. Uh, just think, like, when we say the word imitation, you might think imitation food, right? <laughs> I don't want to eat that. Uh, imitation diamonds. Please don't give me a ring with imitation diamonds, right? Or, or just think of the phrase, um, uh, don't be such a copycat, Right? My parents, actually, they went on a funny story. They went on vacation a couple years ago, and they came back, and they gave me a present. It was a watch. It's, it, was, it was a Rolex. <laughs> yeah. I, you can see I don't really, whenever my parents ask me, hey, where's the Rolex? I'm like, it's in my safe. <laughs> I don't have a safe. Um, <laughs> So imitating, this word imitation, it doesn't have a very good connotation in our culture. It isn't always encouraged. Um, and I think it's because our culture lifts up individuality so much. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're, it's all about we should be unique, right? And, and we shouldn't look to role models because that kind of lacks creativity, right? It's, it's kind of a weakness to ask for help in our life. But I think we need to rethink that. I think we need to rethink this idea in our life. Um, just think about improv music, for example. How many of you guys were here on Friday night? A couple of you? Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> we uh, um, Actually, at our group at UCM on, uh, on Thursday, we had our Christmas banquet, and we had a little talent show at the end of the night. And one of our students is a guitarist, and he, and he just, you know, he, he just started playing, and he was doing some improv for us, and, and it was so cool. And, uh, but if you asked him, um, you know, was that, is that just, you know, you're just good at improv? No, what he would have to tell you is that it took countless hours of practice and learning chords and, and really memorizing techniques and instructions that probably a teacher imparted on him over years, right? The truth is great creative achievement usually comes when imitation precedes innovation. I, I think if you were to ask most great leaders um, you know, they would point to the shoulders on which they stand. They would, most great leaders would tell you the mentors in their life, right? The people who helped them get to where they are. So many of us believe that discipleship is something that we can kind of just do on our own, right? I just need to do personal Bible study with my personal relationship with Jesus. But we just don't see that. We just don't see that in Scripture. We don't see that in the early, early church. Um, you know, we really have to ask ourselves, can we really do discipleship on our own? So you have to ask yourself then, if the answer is no, then who is it that you're following? Who is it you've invited into your life? Who is it that you're trying to imitate? Who do you look to to be a model of godliness in your life? What aspects of their life are you trying to imitate? When I first uh, moved to Kelowna about seven years ago, um, it took me a while, it took me a couple years actually, to realize that I had lost being in kind of a personal and, and regular connection with mentors in my life. In my life back in Vancouver, I had people like that in my life, but when I moved here, I was starting to miss that. And I remember one Sunday morning, I was sitting in church, and, and I, was, I was realizing this, and I looked across the congregation, and I saw a man named Joe Berducci. And Joe is in his 70s, and he, he still works uh, full-time teaching piano. The man has so much energy. Joe leads worship in our church, and he, he faithfully gathers people to pray early before church. He's that kind of guy who, you know, on a number of occasions would come up to me on a Sunday morning and say, you know, James, I've been praying for you this week, and, and I have this word of encouragement for you, and he just speaks life into me all the time. He's that kind of person. It's one of those people that you could just see kind of patience and gentleness all over him. And as I sat in church there on that Sunday morning, I thought to myself, well, if there's one man in this church that I really want to be more like, I want to be more like Joe. 
I wasn't sitting there thinking, I want to be more like Mike, you know, <laughs> Michael Jordan. That Sunday, I went up to Joe and I asked him, I said, hey, Joe, you want to grab a coffee this week? And I'm a pretty bold person, so I just, just told him straight up. I said, you know what, man, I really need some, some mentoring in my life. And Joe's face just lit up. And he said, I've been waiting for you to ask me that. Isn't that awesome? Who are you following? Who are those people in your life that you want to imitate? Who are the people that you're chasing after that that would show you different qualities of Jesus that you haven't quite got there yet? And who is following you? This is the second question we need to ask ourselves. Who is following us? Because people are. People are following you. Just like I said at the beginning, people are looking at your life. They're paying attention to your social media feed. They're looking and observing and paying attention. People are observing this church. They're following you. Um, When I did some reading on uh, this passage, John chapter 10, um, I read an interesting fact about sheep um, in a book about, from Ken Bailey. And he said that when a family buys a new sheep from another shepherd, that that sheep at, at first are, is unaccustomed to that new shepherd's voice. And so when the shepherd calls his sheep, all the other sheep come running, but the new sheep stay behind. And so one of the ways that um, the sheep learn to be accustomed to this new voice is by following other sheep. When those sheep hear the shepherd's voice and respond, those sheep are trained by the other sheep. Paul, writing to his disciple Timothy in chapter 2 of 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 a second letter to him, says, What you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Did you catch that? Paul is in a discipling relationship with Timothy, and he instructs Timothy to go and find faithful people, but not just anybody. He says, find people who can teach other people. Like, talk about strategic Paul. (laughs) Paul hasn't just got his sights on the next generation. Paul's got his sights on the next, next, next generation, right? Right? And we know, we know Jesus' call, right? Jesus, Jesus dies, he's resurrected, he comes back, and he, and he, and he shares with the disciples, and he, and he gives them these words, right? In the end of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, he says, go and make disciples. Like, shouldn't we just hang on? Like, someone, like, we hang on people's words, like their last words, like before they die, right? Maybe you've had someone in your life, like, and you, you hang on their last words, Imagine, like, how important it is for us to hang on Jesus' first words back from, the, from death. Jesus calls us, and he says this clarion call, this great commission. We're called to go and make disciples. Now, maybe at this point in the sermon, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, so I'm going to have to go. I, I need to pay attention to who am I following. I need to go and make disciples. But where do I even start? I mean, for Jesus, he he would call people to come follow him, and it seemed like they would drop everything and come follow him. How do I do it? Well, as you read the Gospels, you'll probably notice that Jesus didn't really spend a lot of time hanging out with people who weren't receptive to him. More often than not, we see Jesus spending time in people's homes of people who welcomed him, people who invited him over, right? Simon Peter's home and the scene with Mary and Martha and, and Levi's home. And we see this often over and over. Jesus spent time with people who were receptive to him and his message. As Jesus says in Matthew 15, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so when Jesus trained his disciples to go out, when he sent out the 12 and when he sent out the 72, Jesus told them to identify these lost sheep and call them to follow. We have a passage in Luke chapter 10 where where Jesus actually gives us some tips, some insight into how we should go and do this. He says, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. 
If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat whatever is offered to you. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, go find people of peace, people who are receptive to you, people who welcome you. Find people who are open to the gospel, who are curious, who are kind of leaning into you. And um, in biblical culture and language, this, this word of peace is kind of like a greeting. It's a warm welcome. And so Jesus is telling us that we should extend a hand of, of friendship to everyone that we meet and that wherever that friendship is received and reciprocated, we should invest in those relationships. We should spend time with those kind of people. We should eat with them and share our life with them. And those are the first steps towards building a discipling relationship. So who are you investing in in your life? Who's maybe leaning into your life at this time? Do you think maybe you have some persons of peace in your life right now? Ryan actually uh, has printed out a little response card for us tonight. I don't know if we have someone who can hand those out or yes or no. We're going to give you guys a little response card. And on it, it has three spaces. It has three spaces where you can answer, who are you following? And then there are three spaces where you can answer, who is following you? I find when I actually write things down, there's a much higher chance that I'm going to pay attention to it. Then I'm going to follow through with it. Oh, they're right here. Isn't that convenient? Thanks, guys. Now, you might ask, well, why three spaces? Um, it, it's okay. When, if, you, if you're drawing blanks and you can only find one, or maybe if you've got five, that's all right. But the reason why I picked three is because I've found when you look at the Gospels that although Jesus called 12 to follow him, he had sort of this inner circle of three. He had these kind of this special relationship with three of the guys. Just think, who was in the boat with Jesus? Who was, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration with him? Who was, who was with him in the Garden of Gethsemane? There's always the three guys, right? Peter, James, and John. Jesus kind of picked a few to invest deeply in, to share intimately with, to give them more time in his life. So as we close our time together, I'm going to invite the band back up. I encourage you to take that card. If you have a pen right now, I encourage you to just kind of jot down those names that have been bubbling up in your head. If you don't have a pen, I just encourage you to stick that in your pocket. Maybe let this be something you sort of hang on to. Stick it in your Bible. Stick it wherever, you know, your journal or whatever. And, uh, and let that be something you keep coming back to. And I encourage you, maybe even, maybe even let it come back to it for over the next six weeks or so as we go into the new year and as you've been thinking about how am I being intentional about inviting people who I can follow and inviting people who will follow me. So as we close our time together, imagine if every maturing disciple in this church invested in just three people this next year. Imagine if everyone here tonight were to help those three people along in their discipleship and, and they would imitate them ways that they were trying to follow Jesus and, and ways that, that, that they, could, they could move towards more faithfulness in Christ and, and that they would share their heart affection of Jesus with them. And imagine if, if you know, I, you know, I'd like to come back in a year's time or, or two years' time and see what is Jesus doing through this community in that way? Have they now found three people? So the three people you invested in, have they found three people they could invest in? Are we building in this idea of multiplication in our idea of discipleship? Discipleship is about becoming like Jesus. Sheep that know the shepherd's voice. Sheep that follow the shepherd wherever he goes. And at the same time, Jesus has called us that we're not only meant to be sheep from the front, but that we should look like shepherds from the back. And he doesn't ask us to be perfect examples, but we are meant to be living examples of, 
of him in this world. We're point to point others to the good shepherd. Amen? Amen.
if you'd like to have some time of prayer, I'm sure there'd be people who come and pray with you up here in the front. Uh, for the rest of you, I, I would encourage you to take this time right now to connect, uh, meet some new people, um, maybe pay attention to those who are, are, you know, people of peace in your life right now, hey? Um, last thing, can I say a word of benediction? Um, usually when I, uh, I try to encourage people, maybe open your palms like this in order to receive this. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Do you love when we try to have a secret conversation when everybody's watching? Yeah, didn't work this time. Let's do yes and amen.
Anybody? Anybody? Do you know that he's faithful? Cool. Okay. 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 Well, that some of you are not sure. That's okay. I'm gonna pray that this week you experience that for sure. Okay. He is faithful. You can trust him. Okay. This is your official dismissal. Have a lovely week. <laughs>